Um, I mean, if you want, we can uh, start off with the easy problems. So I noticed, mm -hmm. so you signed up, you uh, ambitiously signed up for only medium and hard problems. Um, but we can talk about the easy ones first. Because uh, I, I did look at more, I mean, I didn't sign up for any, but I did uh, look at the... Mm -hmm. No, these. Um, so I guess if you want to, well, I guess we can just start with the first, the first easy one. Sure. Um, uh, so these. I need to find my PDF first. Um, okay. So at least in my book, the first easy one is asking about the difference between an ordered categorical variable and an unordered categorical variable. Um, and the, the way that I, I think is most useful to think about this is that an ordered categorical variable is sort of like a failed attempt at getting a continuous measurement. Hmm. So, so if we want to know, so for example, you know, if we want to know, uh, how much we write on a survey, how much do you like ice cream, right? Presumably that's like a content, like, well, who knows what preferences are in people's heads, but I think people would think it's more likely that it's something continuous than something that has like seven discrete points. But nevertheless, we give them like a, a Likert scale from not at all gross as like one to my favorite food on earth seven right and so yeah. so so i think that's that that's how i think of it so if it can be conceptualized the thing we're trying to measure can be conceptualized as a continuous latent variable which i think is the terminology used in the book then yeah, we would, can, regression, yeah. then we would consider it an ordinal categorical variable That's my, that's my. Yeah, I think that's quite a nice um, uh, paraphrasing because, well, all that I can um, say for all the categorical variable is, you know, like a, a very textbook definition, which is a variable with natural ordering, whatever that actually means. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I, I, I like, um, when you said that the categorical or the categorical variable is just continuous measurements, but not really continuous, like size and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and sometimes there are these interesting cases where like, imagine we're doing something with education. So I think sometimes people use education like and this is, I think, that, yeah, this is an interesting case where you can either think of it as years of education, which is in a way a discrete variable with an ordering, it's more like a count variable. Mm -hmm. You could think of it that way, but sometimes, at least in, at least in the social sciences, we would want to use education kind of almost like as a a proxy for like amount of education you had where education isn't just like years but it's something about like the information that you got or the amount of acculturation that you got mm -hmm. and in that case i i think uh yeah i i didn't really think about this before i started talking just now but in that case it's almost like a proxy for a continuous thing like amount of information or something like that i don't know um but so so there are definitely cases i guess my, my point i'm trying to make is that there are cases where it could kind of go either either way we could either think of it as something with a but the, although the distinction here would not be between the i guess this this distinction would be between like a count variable and a ordinal variable maybe yeah, never mind. I want to. I think this is an interesting thing to think about, but I don't think it's quite exactly what this chapter has in mind. 
Um, because here, I think the distinction is in this chapter, I think the distinction is between things that are really obviously uh, unordered categories. Like I put species of animal was my example for a, mm -hmm. an unordered categorical variable because there's no, there's no latent animal dimension really, for example. Okay, those are all my thoughts about one. Uh, second one, second easy question. What kind of link function does an ordered logistic regression employ? How does it differ from uh, the ordinary logit link? And so in words, the difference is that one, the, let's see. I just do this. So, oh. um, so in words, let's do this. Okay, I should be showing the screen. It's kind of small though. Um, so here, this question two. So, mm -hmm. the ordinary logit is just a log odds. That's what it is. Where phi i is the output of a linear model. Um, yeah. So, um, and this will take law, these will take these odds and go to, uh, right, right. So that's the scale in which we have that. Um, but then we have to, well, never mind. And so, well, here's what they have in common. And I just quoted from him. The logit is the log odds. The cumulative logit is the log cumulative odds. And the purpose of what they have in common is that they constrain probabilities to be between zero and one. And so, I mean, I didn't do any big thinking about this, but the, the equations look pretty similar. Um, so here we have log of indeed the cumulative odds. So it's odds because it's P over one minus P, but here the P really is a cumulative probability, uh, which is given here. So anyway, I don't have any wise words about it, but that is, seems to be the case. So, well, um, I'll try. So, well, the similarity is that both actually uses the logit link, but then mm -hmm. the difference is that for the logistic regression, um, so it tries to categorize, for example, um, one and zero, whereas for the ordinal regression, it tries to cate cate or categorize or classify one and one against zero, uh, as well as everything below it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the subtle or yeah, subtle difference between the um, logic link in logistic regression and the cumulative logic li uh, link in ordinal regression. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's good, it's good. So that's like the, the functional difference is that, so right, so right now we've got a, it's almost like a, a multi-class problem, an ordered multi-class problem where we actually need yeah. probabilities for all the categories. And we have one of them being a base category, but yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so this one, actually, I was just, in, I was reviewing right before this and thinking about it, I was having a, a well, okay. So the question is, um, when count data are zero inflated, using a model that ignores zero inflation will tend to produce, uh, which kind of, uh, inferential error. And so, so I was thinking about it and just trying to get the right framework. And at one point I was like, okay. I assume when he talks about inferential error, he's just talking about type one versus type two, or type one and type two. Um, 
because those are the main inferential errors. I mean, we could just talk about, so that, I mean, I, I assume that's what he's talking about. You could have other inferential errors where you have uh, bias, like, like another type of inferential error is not with detection, but is with bias. So you could have like upwardly biased estimates, downwardly biased estimates, okay. estimates biased towards zero, which I guess would lead you to a type two error. But um, then uh, anyway, so so I, I don't know. I kind of ignored whether or not, and now that I think about it, if you have a bunch of zeros, that would actually downwardly bias Maybe that is what you're saying about. Anyway, I just uh, just realized that now. So it seems like if you have uh, if you ignore zero inflation, then that will downwardly bias or bias towards zero, which are two different things. But yeah, I guess although in this case where zero is the minimum, maybe they're not that different. Oh man, lots of thoughts. Um, but uh, that would downwardly bias the parameter estimates because you'll have you could have um, you could have this like set of regressors. You could have like a covariate situation which would typically have like a high predict a high rate, but for some reason it's a, like it's a, what, he doesn't use this term, but when I learned zero inflated models, you call them a, a structural zero. So like in his monk example, it's when the monks drink, like it's just, they're going to produce that, mm -hmm. that monastery is going to produce zero manuscripts. It doesn't matter what Lambda, the rate parameter is, like it's gonna be zero. So I learned that's called a structural zero. And so in his example, there's no, uh, there are no, um, he doesn't do regression with zero inflated models. Like, like he does, so regression in the sense of attaching predictor variables to the rate parameter. Or no. Wait, what do you mean by he didn't do any regression with the, um, with the zero inflated? So, so sometimes, uh, at least again, in my neck of the woods, disciplinary neck of the woods, like you would call, um, so, so if you model a distribution, like the parameters of a distribution, you mm -hmm. might not call that regression. So like in his monk example, he's just trying to find a rate parameter and a probability of zero parameter, basically. But so mm -hmm. at least sometimes, again, in like methodology books I've read, that would be like pre-regression. So it starts being called regression when we start trying to attach characteristics that determine both of those parameters. Like until we have a linear model ex trying to explain variance, variation in those two parameters, like we don't call it regression yet. And that's just really a terminological mm -hmm. thing, but that's, that's the idea. Um, but I mean, obviously to find the two parameters we do basic we, we do a regression but does it anyway regardless of whether or not the terminology is is good does that does the the does, did i explain the distinction at all hmm. so regarding the um whether it is regression or not i totally have no idea about it but uh, um, when I'm seeing the diagram that he has in the book, um, when he's explaining the zero inflated model, to me, it sounds, it looks like, or it feels like he's really is 
is slowly by slowly introducing us to hierarchical model. Because like there is a hierarchy um, of the parameters. So first is the binomial process of zero or not. And if it is zero, then yeah, regard, regardless of anything, um, that the value of the outcome is zero. And then if otherwise, then there is another um, parameter or formula that will explain whatever outcome that the a certain observation has. Um, and yeah, regarding this question, so I'm not entirely sure um, how many types of inferential error are there, but I'm, I just think that, so if a model is zero inflated, then, or if a distribution is zero inflated, then there should be more zeros. And with more zeros, then the mean should be lower. And if we don't model that, then we would somehow maybe overestimate the, the mean because we're not, um, yeah, we are ignoring the zeros. So, so maybe Wait, it's what? like the, the type <laughs> magnitude bias, I don't know. Wouldn't we underestimate the uh, underestimate the mean? Hmm. Because there there would be a big bunch of zeros, and um, we're not we treat all of them as a result ah. of the rate parameter, right? Hmm. So hmm. that's going to drag the estimate of the rate parameter down. Whereas if yeah. we, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure in that case, it would, it would drag it down because we ignore yeah, yeah. that some of the zeros have nothing to do with the rate parameter, that they're just. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the kind of inferential error, so, I think that is the type M and type S are right, the magnitude and sign. Mm. So, yeah. Well, yeah I've, never, I've never heard of those errors. Type, M, type. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting this to look for later. Uh, hmm. Um. Yes, all right, I, I made a note for myself. Um, but uh, is that, are those the, like if someone says inferential error, are those the first two errors that come to mind for you? Um, yeah. Oh. But then I'm not entirely sure whether it's type one or type two in this case. So yeah, I can, and the other type of inferential error that I can think of is the type um, MNS. Mm. You know, now that I think about it, I know that in this book, we're not supposed to, we're encouraged to let go of uh, yeah. null hypothesis significance mm -hmm. testing, which is what type one and type two errors are the context in which type one and type two errors are relevant. So. So maybe I was thinking about it in not the way he wanted us to think about it. And maybe he maybe he really did think about bias because he we do talk about bias quite a bit in the book. So yes. So I think type M errors, given what you've said, would be the thing he wants us to think about. Hmm. Yeah, but we don't know what he thinks, so <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. Um, and um, just real quickly, because I do want to see what the work you did. Um, there's one problem that I, I thought about is the easy four problem, um, where you know he just wants us to think of an example uh, of a natural process that would produce over-dispersed counts. 
And that's pretty easy because he talks about unobserved heterogeneity leading to over dispersion. Mm -hmm. So even something where I, like I was thinking of like cricket counts with temperature. Um, right. So you, you would think that, uh, yeah, anyway, there's a relationship between temperature and and uh, in cricket in cricket chirping, the rate at which crickets chirp. Um, but ma uh, one can easily imagine the like different species of crickets that live and they have different rate rates, right? And so there's mm -hmm. just gonna be there's gonna be that's unobserved heterogeneity. And so you'll have you'll have that happening. So that, that's easy enough to think about. The harder one is under dispersion. I, I really can't wrap my head around uh, that. And so, yeah, it seems, it seems difficult to think about. It seems like it, you, it's easier. It would be easier to possibly come up with a case with a Poisson, so we're modeling counts. It would really, I think a real interesting one was thinking about it in terms of um, probability of success, because that's the other model that is brought up in this chapter. So as we went from binomial modeling, which is the logit, mm -hmm. to beta binomial modeling, um, and now we have, we go from Poisson to gamma Poisson. Anyway, so I don't have any interesting thoughts, but, but I hope someday I can think of under dispersed counts an underdispersed counts model, but nothing comes to mind. I'm sure if I typed underdispersed counts in Google, I could come up with something, but I'm going to try to think of it on my own. But if we encounter this underdispersed counts and we fail to take that into account, would that be a problem at all? Because uh, well, for over dispersion, if we don't take that into account, then we will fail to model the extra variation, right? And then yeah. it's like the opposite end of the spectrum would be we're explaining too much then. Or, yeah. I think, um, I, I think just the issue would be that the, um, estimate of the, the variance would be incorrect. So we would have, <clears throat> mm -hmm. we would think that our uncertainty, we would overestimate our uncertainty. So, I mean, just if, you know, we are researchers who want to publish something, you know, maybe we would say, oh, this, oh, you know, has too much overlap with across zero. Um, so it doesn't seem like a very strong effect or a very precisely estimated effect when in reality it is more precise than we, than we thought. So it's not as, in one sense, I guess it's not as bad of an error. Like it doesn't yeah. mislead us, but it does make us less certain than we could be. Yeah, it's actually like a happy accident. That's how I think of it. Yeah. Yeah, but it just seems to me that it would be such a weird thing. Like, I, I can't even think about what the opposite, like if unobserved heterogeneity causes um, the over dispersion, like what, what, how would you even phrase what causes under dispersion? Hmm. Like, extra, like, how can you even have extra homogeneity? Like it, I'm not even, anyway, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I'll try to, I'll eventually reread this and maybe think of something. Although I don't think he gives anything, even hints as to what this would be uh, in the book. No. But okay, I don't wanna take any more time away from uh, your problems. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. All right. Um, okay. 
Right, so for the 12M1, so we have a four rating and then um, I have to convert it into the um, cumulative logout. So this is just like the step-by-step, -step. well, it's um, quite straightforward. So from the rating that um, I have, so just um, normalized by the sum of rating. And then we have, um, yeah, so, and yeah, so we have the, um, the normalized value of the, uh, the rating that we have. So it's all sum to one. And to make a cumulative proportion, and we can use this uh, come from function. And what it does, it's just it's just like um, the cumulative logouts in which um, the, for example, the second observation is the sum of the first and the second um, uh, rating, and so forth. And to calculate the cumulative uh, logouts, so it's um, just like calculating the logit in which we have a uh, log p divided by one minus p. But here we have the log um, cumulative proportion divided by one minus the cumulative proportion. And then we have here yeah, this uh, some sort of um, threshold or well, it's not really a threshold in this case, but the cumulative logouts in which um, the last observation has the infinite value. So I think this one is um, quite straightforward. Okay. And then for the 12M3, yeah, so um, honestly, I quite like, I think now it. I finally, can have a slight grasp on this zero inflated distribution. I really like the um, the diagram that he have about the um, yeah that the zero inflated um, distribution are just a mixture of binomial processes and whatever distribution um, that we can have if the observation is not. Um, zero. And so what I'm doing here, I'm just swapping the right hand side of the equation with um, the binomial um, process. But honestly, now I already forgot how I came into this one, because it has been yeah, a week uh, since I last touched this. Um, but the idea is just that, um, so we have two probabilities. So first of all, um, the probability of zero given, um, given the parameters and the probability, probability of observing non-zero counts um, also given the other parameters. So, yeah, honestly, I already forget how I uh, come into this, but I'll read it and share in the chat later, if you don't mind. But what I quite enjoy is um, working on the association between the hurricane names, um, femininity and deaths. So briefly in the um, exercise question, so there is, um, so someone tries to explain the higher rate of mortality after incidents of hurricanes with family names in which um, the residents that are struck by the hurricanes underestimate the lethality or the magnitude of the hurricane because of the family name. So here, yeah, so we are using this uh, hurricane data and it has um, the, all these variables in, within the data frame. And so far I've only used um, the femininity, but I haven't used the ad other 
covariates that may help explaining. Right? Maybe it's um, explained in the, or we'll do that in the um, remaining questions, but I haven't even looked at the remaining questions. So what I'm doing here, I'm just uh, standardizing the um, femininity. And then afterwards, I'm tinkering. Um, so, so here, what I'm doing, I'm trying to simulate um, the. So I'm trying to simulate. Yeah. Yeah. So here is the um, generative model of the. Um, um, of the regression. And here, using this as a reference, um, I try to um, sort of like a get uh, calculating the prior predictive check to, so I'm trying to see whether my prior makes sense or not. And you may see that the values look arbitrary and it is arbitrary. So I'm trying to tune um, the prior by looking at the shape um, of the um, of the so on y axis we have that and on x axis we have the standardized um, femininity and so far so I only so far I only try to have that there is a, a U shaped curve across the um, across the range of femininity. So that can be caught. So on either end of the um, spectrum, we can have a higher depth compared to when the name of the hurricane is neutral. Maybe if we have a very strong power information, we can also um, try to um, make the prior such that we are only seeing this um, uh, this increase in that's in one of the end of the spectrum. But in this case, because we still don't know whether femininity causes a higher counts of deaths. So I just um, make it like this. And so I tried very strange, like 0 0.5 uh, for the, for the, a beta of the femininity. So I tried 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0 0.1. So like 0 0.5, it's the slope is very, um, it's quite, um, it's quite flat. And 0 0.7 give this, um, give this um, appearance. And point and 1.0 give a very high increase in um, in that um, as a function of femininity. So, so I don't really think that it's reasonable to see a like an exponential increase in that just by um, the fem just by um, femininity of the hurricane name. So I think. 0 0.7 is, to me, it looks quite okay. So do you think that you would consider that a, a skeptical prior? If, so to me, I look at it and think so, because I'll, like if you look the, how many, a thousand. Uh, so I would say, I don't know, probably 900 of the thousand lines are, kind of contained basically in that black box down at the bottom. That is, is like, true. Um, but which yeah. I, th I think is is right, given, <laughs> given a sort of reasonable skepticism about it. But anyway, I know, I think that was uh, some good prior work you did. Hmm. Yeah, you're right, especially um... Yeah, I'm actually quite curious now how many lines do I have from out of this 1,000 um, sample 
that have some sort of um, a U shape um, curve. And maybe I can increase the uh, mean of uh, for this. Uh, so maybe like there is yeah, the, you know, I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure zero and one doesn't make any sense because it will just overshoot um, at the range. Mm -hmm. But yeah. so yeah, and then I just um, so using the model that I have described here, and I fit the model with the data, and then get the basis. Uh, and then afterwards, I can um, visualize um, the actual count of deaths as a function of the standardized community. And at first, I thought I am doing something wrong because so what you should see here are both the estimate and the credible interval but you're only seeing a line here. So it's like here, the credible interval seems to be very narrow that it actually overlaps with the line of the estimate. And we can see that um, in addition to that, the line of the estimate seems to be, um, um, seems to be influenced by the um, well, it's not really an outlier, but uh, by the um, a few observations that have um, a high um, number of deaths. Uh, so the influential observations over here. But to me, it doesn't look like that there is any evidence that femininity um, has anything to do whatsoever with um, the increasing number of deaths. And when I look at this, then I'm thinking of, is it actually possible to do spline, splines using base? Because when I see this, so this, this U shape doesn't really make sense anymore. And I just want to see like this some sort of um, curve that goes upward from this end and then slowly goes upward um, at the other end of the axis. But of course, that would support the hypothesis that increasing femininity of the hurricane mean um, is associated with a higher number of deaths um, after the hurricane. But anyway, so using the PSIS, then there are indeed um, observations that are very influential. And of course here, um, I'm not modeling any um, over dispersion. So yeah, so this, um, the several observation that have extra variation and then here I, I try to be, um, to uh, model instead of using the Poisson, just use a gamma Poisson model. And then here, what I uh, notice is that oh, one moment, I think zero point. So the mean is actually point. Okay, so the mean for the femininity is still more or less the same. It's 0 0.24 here. And here it's 0 0.21. But then the variance, when we are using the gamma Poisson model, um, it's much higher here in the gamma Poisson model compared to when we are just using the Poisson. It's like um, with the Poisson, we have 0 0.03 and we have the gamma Poisson, we have 0 0.24. So a very different estimate. And when we look at a credible interval, it also 
here, it doesn't include a zero, uh, whereas here it does include a zero. So I guess that's where the under the dispersion, um, where modeling of a dispersion comes into rescue. But then still, uh, when I'm modeling, or when I'm visualizing the um, prediction, then I can, well, I'm still sure that my model is very crappy to say the least. So now I notice, realize that here in the previous plot, I didn't do anything wrong because here um, I can see the, uh, the ribbon for the credible interval, but still most of the observations are actually outside the, um, the shape. So, of course, this means that there are many things, well, we can do much better uh, than this. Yeah, well, one thing about the observations being outside the shade is that the shade is the uh, 89... description, right? So that's when observations appear out a lot. I don't know yeah. if you could hear, I just got a not notification that my internet was unstable. Yeah, I can hear you so. Yeah, well, that's what I thought at first, okay. but then looking at how many dots I, I have um, under the line and ribbon, I doubt that even if I increase the percentile into maybe one to 99% percent, a percentile, I think I still have the problem. And not only um, the error or the width of the interval, I think the shape of the relationship between femininity and that, it doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I mean, it seems like to me this is interesting, actually. Like, I wonder, look at this and kind of gauge. It looks like, I mean, to me, it looks like this entire effect is just driven by the outliers. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. The uh, it just because if you look, it looks like the top out of the top five, for example, the most. Uh, when you call it the, the top five, looks like the top four, did have yes. names with femininity over point five, standard deviations. Mm -hmm. So, so, and then there are just like three of them are just outliers. Yeah. The top three are outliers and feminine. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I think that's, that's the main thing that if we were, if we were on Twitter critiquing this paper when it came out, you know, that would be the thing. I think, I think that would be the main thing to point out is that this is. Yeah. It's actually like in the middle of the, Feminine hurricanes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't able to do the problems that followed this because I tried to do them in BRMS and uh, I got problems with initial values and log likelihoods being negative infinity, causing everything to crash. But, um, and it has something to do with, with interactions in BRMS. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's overall, I don't know. What, what do you think you, you got from this exercise?
Mm. Well. I think we can still do much better than what's um, instructed in the textbook. So I'm actually quite curious, you know, is some sort of like a real world uh, practice to analyze the data using the approach? Yeah, to me it's just, yeah, when I'm, if anyone publish anything where using this plot, I'm just not convinced at all. And regardless if we model the over dispersion or not, yeah, still it doesn't, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any um, association whatsoever because, mo yeah, the slight slope is really driven by this. If anything, the um, the four observations that we have here are actually on the and of masculine hurricane names. So maybe if we sort of remove this and then keep this, then that goes into um, a whole debate about whether we should remove outliers or what even outlier is in the first place. So yeah, there are a lot of things that I'm, I think of when I'm doing this, but just not sure where to start. Maybe I need to start working on with the follow-up questions. Yeah, I, I think so, because I think, so I, because I read the follow-up questions just earlier this morning for me. Uh, and in the, in, in the follow-up questions, more realistic variables are introduced as explanations for deaths, like, the strength of the hurricane, which mm -hmm. I think just, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean, I look at these and I think the reason this looks so funny is because femininity of the name of the hurricane is just a very bad predictor of deaths. I mean, to me, that is, is it. Um, so, so, so yeah, so I think that the following problems are the, the ones that would make you happier. Well, I'm actually also quite curious how one can measure femininity in the first place. So it, it makes sense if you, um, if you, so I, I was looking at those earlier this, this morning. And so femininity is just, um, is uh, if you look at the names and the corresponding, fem so if you, I'm trying to see where name is name. No. Anyway, so so if you if you just look at the data frame, but it, mm -hmm. it helps if you put name and femininity next to each other, then you'll see you'll see what the femininity score is. Like if it's an obviously, or if it's a name that people would say that's a woman's name, it has a high femininity score. Whereas if it's like Bob, it has a very low femininity score. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that it's just from some linguistic judgment database yeah i'm actually quite curious to see what's the most common name uh hurricane name yeah i can i can look it up later <laughs>